Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this webinar with the appealing title, Protecting Horses at Home. This title is not chosen without merit. The recently uncovered scandals related to abuse of horses during training at home are the reason why we, the World Horse Welfare Foundation and the European Equestrian Federation have joined forces to ask your attention and cooperation in actions against these abuses. With this webinar, we will delve into a crucial aspect of equine welfare, safeguarding our horses within the confines of our own environments. As equestrians, we understand the profound bond between human and horse. It's our responsibility to ensure their safety, comfort, and well-being always, even within the familiarity of our own stables. But what exactly does it take to protect our horses effectively? As we have seen, rules and regulations alone are not enough. When stakeholders fail, to prioritize the welfare of horses, say not only tarnish their own reputation, but also undermine the integrity of equestrianism. We must cultivate a culture of respect and empathy towards horses. Even in the confines of our homes, every action, every interaction shapes the perception of our sport. So how do we make stakeholders aware of their responsibilities? And how can we help them to keep the standards as necessary? How can we ensure that also a training at home is done in a way that respects the horses? Education and advocacy are key. By fostering a deeper understanding of equine behavior and needs, we can instill a sense of duty towards our horses. Let's also not forget that our actions today shape the future of our sport and the well-being of those who enrich our lives in ways beyond measure. However, there is more that we must look at. To go deeper into the issue and look at what stands above and drives these poor behaviors. These includes the pressures to compete and the standards that competition is setting. Do we need to investigate the fundamentals of our disciplines? The way that dressage is judged? The question here is whether what we want to see from a horse during its competition performance is leaning to training methods that are not acceptable. While standards may vary, one thing remains clear. The welfare of the horses must always be paramount. It's not about being demanding, it's upholding a standard of care that every horse deserves. Horses should perform, perform within their capabilities. Another important part is the role that national federations must play in maintaining accountability within our community. As the survey, which will present it later, will show there is a lot of concern from stakeholders mostly at national levels about the way our sport is run. This is a very important fact. It shows there is an important role for national federations to be more actively involved and that stakeholders ask for it. We need to consider what is in our control and the control of our national federations and empower these federations to ensure and enforce regulations built on education and protect the horse who is in the center of the sport. Together, let's commit to protecting horses during training at home, not only for their sake, but for the integrity and longevity of equestrianism itself. I wish you a very interesting and fruitful webinar. I'm pleased to welcome Eleanor Kelly, as our moderator today. Eleanor is an ex-professional eventer and British journalist with vast experience in both written and broadcast journalism. 
Her past experiences within the sport have led her to become an entrepreneur and designer seeking horse welfare-driven solutions. Eleanor understands the threat our, our sport is under and will lead us through today's horse welfare discussion. Eleanor, the floor is yours. Thank you, Theo, and also for, for such wise, wise words. Um, and thank you everybody for joining us wherever you are and taking time out of your day. Thank you also to the European Equestrian Federation for hosting what I hope will be a very insightful and thought provoking webinar on what is such a significant topic. Now, you don't need to hear from me. We've got some very interesting people on our panel. Um, we will start off and I'm going to introduce you to Ulf Bromster, who is the sustainability chair of the EEF. Um, and he's the, the representative um, from the EEF to talk on this subject. He has overseen the sustainability strategy development at the EEF, in which sustainability is a truly holistic term, representing matters that involve the environment, the humans and the horse. Ulf was previously president of the Swedish Equestrian Federation and brings forward a wealth of knowledge from his time inside the Federation. Ulf will be talking to us on the results of the survey. So Ulf, the floor is yours. Thank you, Eleanor. Um, and thank you for letting me the opportunity to talk about the survey. Um, and as already Theo have talked about, we do know that FAI started the Equine Ethics and Wellbeing Commission, and they did their initial work, they did a survey, they presented the initial result roughly a year ago. And they pointed out six important areas, as you see in the lower left side of this slide. I'm sorry, it, it's a bit wordy, but on the lower left side, that is the six areas that um, the group pointed out. And as Theo already have elaborated upon, given the recent high profile events regarding training methods, uh, we've chosen that as a topic for the today's webinar. And as you probably know, the EAF represents 40 European federations and some other members. And it is, of course, our focus to work within the area of influence and help our federations in the extent of this issue. And we want to understand what kind of actions can be taken, what we can learn from each other, what could be a best practice to maximize the horse welfare at home. Um, so given then the survey and the result of the survey, um, we sent the survey to around 800 persons, emailed to 800 uh, email addresses. It's also been spread on the social media. And yes, as you can see, the survey has been accessed and the, the um, mandatory question have been completed by nine and a half thousand individuals. Nine and a half thousand. Um, out of those, more than five thousand have also responded to the optional comment area in, uh, with expanded feedback and they have shared their experiences. 94% of the responses are from um, the European countries and 5% are from the North America. And as you can see on the right side, uh, roughly 20% of the responses are equally from Sweden and from Germany, roughly a little bit more than 10% from France and Norway, 5% from Denmark, and then they're spread around other countries. Um, and this is, of course, depending on how the link for the survey has been spread in the different countries. But what one can say is that it's a huge interest of this topic anyway. So, so that's uh, the main conclusion. If you then have a look on who have responded to the survey, and this slide is a little bit tricky, and I will explain why. Um, it's because of, you can, right, thank you, Alice, um, you, you could have multiple answers. So you as an individual can answer that you are both a national owner of a horse, as well as a groom and a natural federation representative. 
that means that if, if you're very fast in math and you start to calculate on the right side how many responses there are, there are roughly 16,000 who have responded in the categories. Out. So there are multiple answers from several persons. Um, if you have a look on these numbers then, roughly 40% of 39.5 are stated natural riders. Roughly a quarter, 26%, is natural owners. On this slide, on the upper right corner, you can see FEI categories. And if you look on the ones who are in the competition, the rider, owner, and grooms, they're roughly 15%. And on the upper left, you can see 50% or 1,440 persons, others. That is such as uh, hobby owners, riders, who's so not organized in any way. Um, but it's a good spread. It's a lot of different categories. Um, and as I said, the most common one is what they themselves have called themselves natural riders. Um, then when we looked into what, what are, are you concerned? So we asked on the level of concern of the horse welfare at home. Then, of course, it can be a little bit... Um, nervous when you see these numbers. Uh, that is, there is a clear high level of concern. As, as, in, as you can see on the far right side, almost a quarter states that they're always concerned regarding the horse welfare when uh, training at home. One third, a bit more than one third, is often concerned. And 30% sometimes concerned. So it's, it's only 10%, which is rarely or no concerns at all. So 90% in some senses are concerned about uh, uh, the horse welfare at home. Um, and I, I think that um, Theo elaborated a bit on it, but we also asked, to, we asked them what they felt drove the people towards poor training methods. And that was a free text answer. So we, we gathered the, the uh, responses and, and out of that, what we can see is the most similar themes are money. That is you're driving your training in a non horsewell situation because of the money. That is to get to money. Um, pressure from competition. Expectation from judging and officials at competition. Lack of education or culture. So these are the main themes that we see from the responses. Uh, then we ask if they see that we have regulations in place. And a regulation in place, I would say, for training methods at home, to be very clear. 48% means of this picture said yes. They do believe that we have regulation in place um, for training at home. 18% states no, and 34% they were unsure. Uh, if the response, uh, if the respondees were aware of rules, only 10% felt the rules being applied. So even if the state that yes, there are rules, only 10% felt that the rules as such were applied. And we asked them um, why they felt that the rules were not applied. Then it's stating that the lack of resources, lack of evidence, no control outside competition, and there's no willingness to investigate this area. Um, continuing then, um, the next set of questions were about if anyone have witnessed training behaviors that they believe compromise the horse welfare. And 90% of the respondents state that they have seen that. Of those, almost 60% say that they witnessed that during the last six months. 60% of 
this last six months. Um, Then the question were if they had been asked to carry out a training action that they felt compromised the horse welfare. 47% stating that they've been asked to do that. And then the tricky question is, of course, that if you ask a person if they would intervene, if they observed a situation that compromised the horse welfare, 44.6% or 45% said yes, which is, I would say, reasonably good. So half of them at least state that they will do it. 30% were unsure if they would, and 21% stated they will not intervene. So even if they see training method that is not good for the horses, 21%, one of five states that they won't intervene. And when asking why they would not intervene, they're stating the risk for their reputation, risk of employment, uh, fear of not being listened to, unsure if their opinion is correct, pressure from the environment, or fear of being excluded. Okay, but if they do then want to speak up, uh, then 60% state that they don't know who to contact. So if they want to make an if they want to make a complaint, to who should they talk? And 60% do not know. Of the 40% who did answer that they do know, then there was a broad response to whom, such as they will. Uh, talk to the veterinaries, the federation, to the government, or criminal bodies. So, so what one can say is that for the 40% to do know how they should report, there is no consensus on who should handle these questions. Um, finally then, um, we asked what they felt the tools were to the most important to improve the horse welfare at home. So what, what, what can be done then to improve the situation? And as you see on the right side, education and checks and controls were the one that came out on top. And they were followed by punishment sanction as well as positive rewards and recognition of good behavior. So, so uh, <clears throat> again, uh, no no silver bullet, a uh, range of things that needs to be done, but this were where the responses were. Um, what one also can say is that there, there were a possibility to leave a final comment. So there was a final comment box in the survey. Um, roughly, as you can see, 1,700 comments were left. And they all are, of course, as it says here on the sign, then passion for improved standards of welfare and the desire for action. That is pretty clear. Um, there were a lot of comments focused on dressage. And on those comments, it's a belief that the current judging rules and standards are having an effect of the methods of training. And Again, as you already understood from the what I already have said, there's a lack of clarity on who can manage the situation. Is it his role for FEI? Is it a role for the National Federation? Or is it from a horse welfare point, welfare point of view, a governmental body who should uh, take the responsibility? So it's uh, it's uh, unclear. That, that's what you can see from the comments in the, um, the, in the survey. And I think, uh, Alice, that, or sorry, Eleanor, that that was about it. Oh, well, thank you very much. That was very informative. Um, and I think slightly concerning um, that 90% of respondents felt that they'd witnessed training methods, uh, which they felt was detrimental to welfare. 
uh, it does certainly suggest there's a systemic problem. Um, I, I'd be very, this is a rhetorical question, but I'd be very interested to know if any federations have information available to people on how they should report a problem. But we'll move on now to Jackie Potts, who is uh, not only a founder of the International Grooms Association, but also a, a very well-known international groom who has attended no less than five Olympics, five world championships, eight European championships, countless five-star uh, uh, events, badminton, Burley, Lexington, Poe, uh, largely with uh, William Fox Pitt um, and more recently with a member of the Japanese eventing team. She's definitely known as one of the most experienced grooms on the eventing circuit and is passionate about mentoring the future eventing grooms. Um, I had a personal experience with Jackie where I, I briefly kept my horse with William Fox Pitt. On returning from a hack on a rainy day, she informed me that I should not have left the yard without an exercise sheet on. So she's certainly very good at doing her job. Um, it, it's important to say that grooms are very much the lifeblood of the sport uh, and also, sadly, sometimes have to be the whistleblowers. The International Grooms Association was formed in 2022 to assist members throughout their career as a groom by providing support, advice and education to all those working in the industry and also to speak up on the issues that really matter to both the FEI and international show organisers. Jackie, we look forward to hearing from you. Jackie? Jackie, can you hear me now? We can hear you now. Excellent. <laughs> no, thank you very much for inviting me to speak here. Um, I think it's such an important topic, if not just for now, but for the future as well, the future of our sport. Um, as you can see me there at, um, I think that was at Try On World Games. Um, that was whilst I was working for Kazuma Tomoto. I've also, as you said, been working for William for 31 years. Um, I was very lucky before that to work for Di Lampard. I've helped Chris Hewlett at Haddon Stud. Um, I was also at Nine High Performance Sales run by Jenny Lawrence and Clark, where you saw a lot of different riders, different practices trained at the Bartles and, as you say, the different championships. So I have been, as you would say, out and about and seen lots of different things. Um, I think the training at home, that is a different case altogether, isn't it? It's, it's my philosophy is that you have a happy horse that wants to do its job well. And a happy horse is only happy when they're treated correctly. You know, a horse should never be competing through fear or for abuse. I've been very lucky by working for those people that I've worked for good riders with good practices. I think we also need to concentrate on keeping the sport clean, making no misuse of drugs. But I think, you know, it can be at home a misuse of competing or training a horse on drugs when they shouldn't be. You know, very important that the welfare is the main stay of them. Um, the integrity in training, I think nowadays it's quite difficult. There's so many different training aids, isn't there, that are available and can they be abused? This is very difficult from a groom's point of view. If you're at a place where you can see things are not right and how do you step in and say? I mean, I'm lucky that I have such a good relationship with William as well and with Kazoo. And, you know, fortunately, I've never been in that position. But I think the difficulties facing a groom when they see abuse at home is how do they tackle it? How do they speak to the rider? Often the grooms are very young. There's often 20, 21. And at that age, you know, you don't have that confidence of sort of saying, oh, excuse me, but with respect, you know, why are we doing this? Blah, blah, blah. And they're quite concerned about the reaction they're going to get off their rider. Um, you know, also they're wondering, am I going to lose my job if I complain about this? You know, where do I go after? Or am I going to feel that my future's jeopardised because a rider may say, oh, you know, don't employ them. You know, they're not to be trusted. 
or, you know, all down that sort of line. So I think it's really difficult for a groom in that way because ultimately we do it because we love the horses. You know, we love them and we like them and we want them to do well and they become our children. And when you're in that situation, as Ulf was saying, where do you turn to? Who do you who do you contact? I think it would be very brave of a young girl or boy to go to their national federation. You know, it's it's almost this is partly why the IGA and different, you know, the BGA was set up a little bit so that they would have a bit of a sounding board. But then they can only advise. They obviously can't take it any further. And I think that's something for discussion in this session to see where we could maybe have an outlet for grooms to air, air their concerns to. Because I think it's it's a really tricky situation if you're somewhere and you don't know how to go about it. Thank you for that, Jackie. So we now move on to Roly Hours, who is Chief Executive of World Horse Welfare. Roly joined World Horse Welfare as Chief Executive in January 2008 and has been very much a dynamic leader for the organisation. His background is veterinary, a Cambridge University graduate and um, a former vet for the Royal British Army. He has played a very active role on the steering group of the British Horse Council and in that time established the Equine Disease Co Coalition of which he is chair. He is the treasurer of the British Equine Veterinary Association, BEVA, and on the management board of the European Horse Network. He represents the charity both at national and international level. Now, Roly is going to talk to us on how World Horse Welfare deals with welfare cases. Um, this is something they've done for nearly a decade uh, after the charity was was founded by Ada Cole in, in 1927. Um, and, and hopefully he can help us sort of understand how to, uh, the systems of reporting and, and how that, that might be uh, um, sort of brought into use in, in this instance. Roly, over to you. Ellie, thank you very much indeed. And obviously having heard from Ulf around the results of the survey and then from Jackie around the, the challenges or, or what people are experiencing on the ground, uh, which obviously picked up in the survey as well. I think it's important to say one thing. It's, you know, we, we need to realise it is for us to involve horses in sport and entertainment. That's a uh, that's a privilege for us, not a right. And the world around us is changing and we need to be more mindful of how that change is happening. And if we are to stay uh, so we have a, a flourishing sport and leisure sector we need to really show that we are putting the horse as the number one stakeholder which is a very um, regularly said phrase uh, but possibly very much open to challenge about how much of those words are being put into action so I think it is really important that we treat the horse with respect at all times both on the competition field and at home um, and we need to also make sure that we are communicating effectively both within the sector Sector, because there's a breadth of opinion within the sector, but also outside the uh, sector about how we're achieving that. Um, and I think, as I mentioned in a second, you know, the world has been transformed by the the, uh, the quite right focus on safeguarding, safeguarding, protecting children, um, uh, vulnerable adults and other vulnerable people. Um, and I think a lot of read across could potentially come with when we look to how we should be safeguarding uh, the welfare of the horses in our care uh, that we're using in sport and leisure. So I think I. So if we look at the controls pyramid, and and I'll just sort of very briefly unpick this over the next few minutes. You know, there's sort of six core areas: three formal, three informal. And so obviously, um, as we've already touched upon, we've got the sort of the legal law of the land. Um, and obviously that varies between different countries, but then there can be criminal prosecutions based on that law. Um, next to that, obviously from a sporting sector, we obviously have the FEI rules and regulations, and then there are national federation rules and reg re regulations, and there are discipline rules and regulations. And one of the things we so often say, there's no point having a rule if you're not gonna enforce it. So very much having the, 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 the rules and establishing them but make sure that we're enforcing them is, is really important. There are codes of practice uh, across different levels that are sometimes linked to, to laws and regulations. Not always so, but it can form part of that formal mix. 
but they can also form uh, such as the FEI uh, Charter and, and British Equestrian and other, other federations have taken that role on too to establish those kind of charters, which sets out very much the informal um, sort of basis of what the expectations are. It's setting that expectation level. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we will only get people to change behaviour if they do are convinced to change behaviour. So lo looking at what um, techniques we can use and tactics we can use to get people to change their behaviour is, is really important because that will bring help bring around cultural change. And rather than having peer pressure of people uh, being um, frightened and doing the wrong thing, actually peer, peer pressure where you're promoting people to do the right thing. And But of course, the best way and the most dem democratic way, often not the easiest way, is through education and awareness. So people understand what uh, good welfare looks like and that they are able to, to uh, have management and training practices that brings that around. So that's the sort of overview. If I just unpick a little bit more on the what's available to us formally, obviously I've mentioned you know, uh, uh, nationally for each country there or, or region, there will be regulation and, and there's obviously that pro um, ability to prosecute on that level. But of course, this is, you know, when we're thinking about uh, management and training practices in our horses, we're often very far from that from that level. Um, within horse sport, we obviously have the FEI integrity unit, but far more focused around um, the, the clean sport and um, doping or betting and uh, not uh, issues around training practices. So there's clearly a barrier there. The other other barriers include the fact you need to have hard evidence and actually maintaining an, anonymity, if I can say the word, um, is, can, can be quite difficult in that those more formal processes. As I've said, I think we should reflect on all the processes that have been put in place from a formal perspective for safeguarding and how we might read across and what lessons we can learn from establishing the the um, the, uh, the structures, which are often, you know, it's not cheap and it, it is quite involved, but the structures that have been set up there. Um, and as Ellie said, um, World Horse Welfare, we have had um, an advice line and, and a reporting function working very closely in uh, the, in England and Wales with the RSPCA, the Royal Society of Protection of Cruelty Animals and the Scottish equivalent in, in Scotland. But of course, that is a uh, law of the land and uh, it's got... Again, very far away, distant move from, from issues about training practices. It is hugely resource intensive. You need to have a reporting structure online, telephone. You need to have people who are able to go out and investigate uh, those in, in a, um, a completely um, neutral way. Um, and so it, you know, it takes over 20 people to run the, the service that World Source Welfare runs in, in, in Britain. So, you know, clearly it's, it's not a, a cheap thing to do. And we recognise that actually a lot of uh, the reports we get are simply due to la lack of knowledge. There's no criminal, there's no intent to be cruel, but um, there's still ignorance and they end up uh, with animals which are, are either likely to suffer or are suffering. Um, and of course, we do sometimes get vexatious um, reports. Uh, where people are, you know, have fallen out for whatever reason um, and act, we need to be very careful and social media campaigns obviously make that all the easier. Um, and of course, in so many of these cases, actually taking the right action takes time. Um, and again, this relates um, to having a clear law of land in terms of the Animal Welfare Act. Um, and as I said, it's not the same case with tr often with training practices. So then if we look at the informal controls and um, I've already touched on, you know, codes and charters and they, they can have a really important role to play about setting up that that standard of expectation. But I think the key thing with codes and charters is they can't just be words. They can't just be a glossy that goes on the, on the tack room wall. There really has to be an intention to engage what's in on, on those charters actually into daily uh, care and management and training of our horses. Um, now, there are a raft of different um, sort of organisational and human behaviour change in initiatives uh, that you can um, undertake. Um, and the codes and charters can very much play, play a part in that. Um, as is, you know, there is an opportunity. Um, and as as all showed in, uh, in the uh, 
the survey, there's a real lack of understanding about who to report to. And I think there is um, a really uh, opportunity for federations and uh, disciplines to be able to have a clear reporting line so people understand. But I think you've very clearly got to set out the expectations about what level of evidence or what level of contact you're going to take action on, because it's unlikely that anyone's going to be able to take a, uh, action on any individual contact unless it seems very serious. This whole idea of active bystanders, I think, is a, a really interesting one. So people don't just walk by uh, when they see, as we saw in a survey, um, uh, practices which they think were unacceptable. And I think this I think it's actually an Australian military commander who said this. I, I think it's a brilliant saying, you know, the standard you walk past is the standard you, ex you, you accept. And I think, you know, there are different ways of trying to create and train active bystanders standards but it's it's a very um accepted concept in many different parts of society and i think clearly how people do that uh they've got to do it in engaging uh, and an acceptable way because confrontation normally almost always is not the way forward um and i think it it is interesting just to reflect you know society has moved on you know if we think about how uh, we perceive the smacking of of children or drunking drinking and driving or or smoking in enclosed spaces or or not wearing seat belts and you know in, in the uh, um question well do you know the wearing of of safety helmets you know life does move on and so i think there is there is this opportunity to to get a, try and get ahead of that curve because i think if we can create that positive culture uh, if we can create that peer pressure where people are being encouraged to do the right thing rather than being punished for doing the wrong thing, um, that is a, a really good way forward. And as I said, some of the hard lessons learned we have uh, in dealing with people is you, you, it, being clear in when you're, you're you're chatting to people, but always being right and 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 always being open to listen uh, in the, in a two way conversation and actually remaining professional. And of course, at the end of the day, we will solve. We can all go home if edu if everyone is educated and everyone is aware of what the right thing to do and how um, th they need to act to, to do that right thing. But also, then be encouraged through having the opportunity, the capability, and the motivation to make those changes. Then we will be in be a much better place. And so there is a huge amount of change going on. It is only going in one direction, quite rightly so. And if we can actually try and conjoin our efforts more effectively, then we can ensure that th there's a good future uh, for sport and leisure across the world. Ellie, thank you. Thank you very much. Very insightful, as always, Roly. And now we move on to Johan Ferberg, who is Secretary General of the Swedish Equestrian Federation. Um, he has recently taken up this role, having previously worked within the talent development team earlier in his career. Um, beyond equestrian sport, Johan has uh, experience in gymnastics. He was Secretary General of the Swedish Gymnastics Federation. The Swedish Equestrian Federation itself has over 150,000 individual members from 850 associations, and they work to promote and develop equestrian sports both at amateur and competitive level with a focus on issues such as horse welfare, security, safety and sustainability. Um, Johanan was explaining to me earlier that uh, Swedish equestrian has been increasingly under fire from the wider media. Um, so it, it comes back to not just what's going on within the sport, but the public perception of sport. So Johan will be talking to us about the importance of collaboration between national federations. Johan, the floor is yours. Thank you for inviting me and having me. Uh, so uh, first want to stress out that uh, Sweden is a horse loving country, as you said, uh, Eleonore. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of thousands are engaged in the in the horses in, in our country and, and abroad. And that makes this, of course, very intense, but it's also a, uh, a big uh, opportunity for us to change uh, into the future. And uh, as you have been uh, stressing out in this me meeting, uh, Jackie, uh, I have some, some grooms that uh, just recently were very, very brave uh, and they reported 
to us. So, so we have had a couple of cases. And, and that is the first thing I want to do in, in this seminar, as you see in the survey, and also in this meeting, you have a lot of Swedes uh, uh, engaged in this and, and they, they were very, very brave. So we have a couple of, of uh, cases coming up uh, in Sweden and it makes it possible for us, of course, to report them. And yes, we are very active, Eleanor, when it comes to guide our members and also uh, people outside the federation how they can report bo both within uh, to us as a federation to the sports confederations to the fei fei uh, to the governments and so on uh, so so we actually see a little bit of change in paradigm uh, a little bit of a me too uh, movement when it comes to horses uh, and it's an op opportunity, of course, for us to, to, to develop our sports even more in, in a horse welfare perspective. Uh, we have been very focused in, in uh, taking actions in the, those cases coming up. But of course, we're also at the same time looking forward. And I will uh, stress that out late, on a later slide. Uh, we have for decades and very ongoing work. I have to say that we have some cases, but uh, we are very stable and proud of uh, our education. And for decades, we have, have developed a program from basic level to universal level when it comes to education. But of course, uh, and overall, it's an intense debate, but at the same time, it opens up a lot of possibilities to grow together with horses into the future. Uh, we have what action, couple of actions have it been taken? As Eleanor said, it's it's very much uh, in collaboration. Uh, uh, we we can see that we uh, when we look into to our sports that we have the, the leg of, of the sports and it's quite strong and, and and we feel that that we really have control there. But as T also open up the whole this seminar, we have a. Uh, 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 the other leg, where, where where you train your horse on a daily basis at home and, and in the private uh, business. And, and that is why we need to strengthen our co collaboration with the governmental agencies. And also, uh, Eleanor and I talked about when we started up in, in the horse industry throughout Sweden, and we in our country have... Uh, uh, we are beginning to tr trotting, so so we need to stress these qu questions really out together with them. We also work with the sports confederation when it's with the when it comes to change it of status. It's uh, it's it's about regulations again, education as as Rowley talked about is perhaps even more important. But uh, we we need to stress stress stretch out the statues so. So, so our regulations can be more included into the daily basis of the training of the horse. That is, that is what we are aiming for. Uh, we also have uh, tried to take a couple of initiatives. Uh, um, myself talked to the FEI, FEI uh, in in late in the in the late 2023 about that it would be uh, an idea to, to sort of invite, for them to invite to a dressage forum. And, and it was interesting to hear that in the survey that dressage were, was pointed out. And I think it's important to say in this meeting, it's, it's not about pointing out dressage. Dressage is a wonderful sport, but at the same time, it's a basic, it's a fundamental of all riding. So, so, so we wrote a letter after we had a meeting in Gothenburg with the Nordic countries, and very positively, the FEI now responded that they will invite to address such forum after the Olympic and, and the Paralympic Games. And what we will discuss is the basic training of the young horses, how we compete with the young horses, do we need to slow down a little bit, or how, how we do we look into that issue. And, and that's, of course, related to the question uh, of, of money. And, and also we want to stretch out and discuss more about the judging of the horse. So this is very much what we're looking into, uh, gathering, discussing as we do in this meeting, meeting up other people, meeting as uh, stakeholders as, as uh, our, our uh, shows, both national and internationals. And, and 
try to to understand that we work in the sports but also outside sports in the society national and internationally uh, a couple of positions for the sports forum we know that's uh, mainly uh, for discussion but we think also a couple things can be stressed out now uh, it's about the bridal when it comes to dressage we think that's uh, a main a big concern uh, when we see it in, in, in shows, but also stressed out in, in, in media. Uh, we show, we think that the, the whip uh, is something that we uh, uh, can can be used, uh, but but it should be used as a guidance, nothing else. And and we think that we really should stress out the area of antibiotics, and and so that we sort of clean that table uh, and 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 really, really stretch out that we slow down a bit and, and have healthy horses for when we go into competitions. Uh, as a federation, I think Rowley stressed that question out. It's about changing of culture and, and uh, a tool to use is, of course, uh, communication. And, and for a for federation, we try to be uh, very active when, when, when it comes to the debate. Uh, think, we think it's here to stay. Uh, we we need to stress out that we have a uh, ongoing work when it comes to horse welfare, but we need to improve all the time. Uh, and and we think that media is, is of course important to to all of us to, to improve in different ways, but it also can be used both in responding and 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 working yourself. And and we think it's important to uh, to be communicative to co communicate bo both inside and, and outside the sports. So that was a very, very short, short summary, but it's very intense, but the same thing, same time, very positive that we can uh, use this great engagement that we are sort of feeling for the moment. Thank you, that I think was my 10 minutes. Thank you, Johan, very interesting. And finally, we move to Constance Winter, who uh, takes the role of the general counsel within the German Federation and herself has direct experience in the management of welfare cases, which she is going to talk about. The German Equestrian Federation is uh, an umbrella organization of all breeders, riders, drivers and vaulters in Germany, and therefore not only takes care of all riders and riding, but also of numerous topics relating to horses, including welfare. The German Equestrian Federation is the eighth biggest sports association in Germany and the second largest federation in terms of federations within the FEI. Uh, now, I think we're aware that, um, that there have been certain changes by the national, uh, Fed German National Federation to dressage. Um, we should emphasize that Constance is not a dressage expert, but will summarize hopefully what, what has been going on. Constance, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much, Eleanor. It's a privilege to discuss such an important matter with all of you. Well, as you said, I'm the general counsel of the um, Equestrian Federation, in, and in that role, I'm dealing with disciplinary cases in all areas, which includes animal welfare. And today I'd like to focus on three aspects that I think are crucial with regards to the management of cases. If you want to try a case, uh, you need first a good legal framework, meaning the right rules to do so. Then you need these rules to apply to both the situation that you're dealing with, as well as the people that are accused of a violation. And finally, you need a solid factual basis that doesn't just crumble away in the first moment somebody said, well, this isn't true. Starting with the legal framework. I'm not sure how you'd put it in English, but in German, there is a saying that applies to pretty much everything, including our rules, and it goes, change is the only constant. We are constantly trying to improve our rules. We are constantly learning, and of course, every now and then, we detect deficiencies that need to be remedied. It was only the beginning of this year that we have reformed our entire rulebook on competitions and brought quite a number of um, adjustments into effect, a lot of which were motivated by animal health, animal welfare deliberations. 
An example would be the limitation of the number of competitions that you are allowed to take part in with a young horse, especially. There's one adjustment that I that we've already made in 1990 that I would like to especially especially point out because I've recently learned that it isn't exactly standard with all national federations. In 1990, we have created a rule that allows us to apply disciplinary authority not only to horse welfare incidents that happen during an event, but also that happen during training or any other occasion. And since we are talking about training methods today, you will see how this is important. But you might wonder why this is so extraordinary. And that's because our entire set of rules is principally designed to be applied at events and competitions. And this is true for all sports federations, because providing a legal framework for sports events, that's where we all come from. So now we have to explicitly and intently pick the areas that we feel we need to regulate even out of competition. And we have to explicitly, explicitly lay it down in our rules. So as the German Federation, we have picked three areas that are of outstanding importance to us. And these are safeguarding athletes, its horse welfare and its medication of horses and athletes. And you've probably realized that the last rule that I was talking about already connects with my second point. We need our rules to apply both to the situation as well as we need it binding for the accused person. With regard to the situation, I feel that we have pretty good coverage when it comes to horse welfare incidents because of the rule that I just explained to you. This is, however, not always true with regard to the acting people. As a sports federation, we do not exude public authority. This means that we can't just apply our rules to anybody. What we do is we try and bind as many people as we can to our rules by contracts. And you probably know these contracts because we call them a license. So if you want to take part in a competition, you need a license. If you want to become a judge, you need to be licensed. And if you go through our education program for coaches, well, we give you a license in the end. Today, I think our focus is on equestrians that compete, maybe even internationally. So the ap applicability of the rules is hardly ever a problem with this group of people. They do have a license. In our daily practice, however, I would say that about half of the cases um, we have a problem with this. This is an issue, the applicability of the rules altogether. Moving on to the factual basis. All of the steps that I've just been talking about are the easy ones. The hard part is to create the factual basis of the case. De facto, it's very difficult to collect evidence, especially if an incident does not happen at an event, meaning in public. Witnesses are often really quite reluctant to make themselves available for trials. Sometimes complaints are even anonymous. The main reason Jackie has already pointed out, and I think it's true, it is that witnesses are afraid that they may be exposed to repressive measures or anything like that. But there's another aspect that you can also deduct from the survey, and it's kind of bugging me really. A lot of people seem to think that it's solely the Federation's obligation to investigate and intervene. So they think, well, I've made my complaint, job done, the rest is up to the Federation, and they overestimate our powers. We do not have an army of private investigators. We cannot just show up and search the premises. I cannot even force a witness to make a statement. If things go well, the complainants provide us with pictures. And that's a great first step, but it doesn't take you all the way. It can be surprisingly hard to connect a result such as an injury or a suspicious, suspicious movement sequence to a specific violation by a specific person. And in order to impose a sanction, we need both. 
Sometimes I argue with witnesses or our veterinarians when they tell, tell me I need to punish somebody because they have proof that a horse is clearly injured. And I need to explain to them that I can't because I don't know who inflicted the injury, who did it. I'm not saying that it is impossible, but we do need complementary evidence. I remember a case where I even got videos of the action and we were still struggling with the case. In German law, it is prohibited to inflict pain, suffering or harm on an animal. And in this case, we have experienced that it can be quite hard to prove that the horse is suffering pain, especially when all you've got is a three second video sequence. We all know the, we all know the nature of horses. They suffer quietly. And quite often you need to take a good longer look at the behavior of the horse in order to assess whether it is in pain. All in all, the management of horse welfare cases is challenging, but it's also rewarding because it makes you feel like you're doing something important and right. In order to try cases, however, the federations need the support of the um, equestrian community. An anonymous complaint is not enough. Fighting violations of horse welfare is a task for all of us, and we need to tackle it together. Thank you, Eleanor. Thank you very much for that, Constance. Right, well, that was uh, some very interesting points made there. Thank you, Ulf, for summarising the survey with some slightly unnerving results. Um, Jackie, clearly, whilst your own experience with riders have been entirely positive, um, you're only too aware of the pressures on grooms as, as observers of the welfare issues. Um, and Roly, thank you for highlighting the importance of being an active bystander, um, as well as accepting that there has been a change in culture. Johan, um, it sounds like there's a lot of good work being done um, to work together. And um, thank you for emphasising the importance of this sort of transparent communication. And Constance, um, thank you for, for, you know, highlighting the importance of the, having a good legal framework um, and a solid factual basis um, and the importance of continued learning. I think we all know anyone who has had a horse that you never stop learning. Right, um, so we'll now move on to the first discussion point. I think um, let's talk about the reporting. 61% of the respondents didn't know where to report to. I think that's, um, that's a pretty shocking stat really, isn't it? Um, and of those that thought they did, over half stated that they would report this to a vet. From recent cases, many of the reports are coming directly from grooms. Um, and we've heard from Jackie on the grooms experience and that of World Horse Welfare in terms of the reporting system. But is this achievable for our national federations? And how do we balance the management of sports rules with criminal rules? So Ulf, perhaps you can uh, comment on this first. Absolutely, thank you, Eleanor. I mean, first of all, this is a fuzzy area, I would say. Um, the rules are not that clear. We we are a, mainly into the sports for the competition point of view. And that means that what's done in the training area is not really regulated in that sense. I'm, I'm a little bit more positive when I listen to Constance. But we, we have seen so many cases where there is no legislation from a federation point of view in the training environment. So, so this needs to be sorted, what the ways forward is. And then, of course, you can have it as a criminal rule. Yeah, yes, as you said, Eleanor. Um, but that's much, much harder, much harder to get something. Um, we, we are experienced from a licensing perspective as well, yes, as Constance said. Um, uh, but the withdrawal of a license, the basis for that is not clear either from a rules perspective. So it needs to be safety for the ones who got the license as well. So, so we, we really need to have rules and regulations that covers all, also this area. Otherwise, it's hard track. So I'm not surprised by the answers um, because it is unclear. And I think one of the reasons why we are meeting here, that is to share the best practices and see what, what have been successful in any country. What can we learn from and what can then be 
uh, inserted in other countries. So, so I think this is an excellent topic to discuss to get the legislation in place. So I'm not, sorry to say, I'm not surprised by the answers. And I'm glad to hear, for instance, like Constance said, that there might be ways forward that we can learn from. Jackie, you, uh, you need to unmute you. yourself, Eleanor. <laughs> Hi there. Sorry, sorry about that. There was a dog barking in the background. Um, Roly, what 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 about yourself? I mean, uh, you know, um, the World Horse Welfare Reporting uh, System. Well, I I think it's it's not surprising, is it, that, that a lot of people don't know where to to report because it's not clear. And then I think the ones who do know to report, I mean, they report it to their vet, but the vet is in often in no position. To, to do anything about it. And I I, th I suppose the first point I would make here is around collective responsibility. And I think it was Constance who said, it's not just the National Federation. I mean, at all levels, so at a yard level, there should be a clear, you know, culture and a, a code of conduct and a, and a way of reporting it within the yard um, and then building that up. So I think that collective responsibility for everyone to uh, engage in this um, because, I mean, I think it's one thing to talk about the extremes and obviously uh, what all is reported in the media is not always the extreme, but it certainly gets a, a very high profile. But I think, you know, dealing with the extremes is relatively easy. It's, de it's dealing with those day-to-day um, -day practices which people know are unacceptable, but they walk by because for any number of reasons I've just we've heard from Jackie. So I think that um, how we can empower people um is is really important that's got to be done in a constructive way um and i think there is still a huge role for education here because you know poorly behaving horses they behave like that for a reason and so people simply still do not know enough about how horses learn for example um and actually if they're expressing poor behavior the fact that more often than not that's due to undiagnosed pain and discomfort. So it's actually really getting giving people the tools to be able to do right things by their horses, because many people do, but they don't know how to. Um, but I think at the end of the day, um, whatever reporting system you have, and I think it can be an inf informal as well as formal, but it's got to be it's got to try and be as simple as possible, uh, which sets out, as I say, sets out clear expectations, because people will often think if they report it, that something's going to be done about it. There's a reasonable expectation. And I think it's really important that any system that is set up actually is very open in terms of um, and transparent in terms of what it can achieve in practice. Jackie, how um, what advice would you give to grooms in terms of reporting what they feel is a welfare issue in a yard? Step. I'm, I'm mute now. Yeah, I think it's really difficult because many grooms wouldn't feel that they could report to their national federation or the FBI. You know, when we're looking at these are grooms that are working for top riders, maybe there may be grooms that aren't working for riders that are in that system. I mean, I myself try and promote good practices all, all the time and encourage people to think about more about the horse as an animal, you know, with feelings. But many grooms don't always have that support. Um, I mean, I think, you know, with the formation of the BGA and the IGA, I think that's something that they could actually take up a little bit. You know, I think many grooms would be happier to report these instances to they, you know, to either of these um, federation, well, not federations, but, you know, associations. Um, whereas otherwise, I don't think many would even know where to turn to at all. And as you say, they'd report to their vets or a friend. You know, I think they feel very cut off in that situation. And it would be just good to put something out there that gave them a bit of support and they knew where to go to. Obviously, you've been involved uh, as a Green for, for many decades. Um, have you seen it change? Have you seen, you know, the 
we talked about the cultural shift, you know, the practice, the management of horses. How have you seen it, you know, transform since you were first involved? Things that perhaps even you thought were the right thing to do 20 or 30 years ago to, to, to now. Yeah, I mean, I think things have hugely changed, haven't they? Um, I mean, one of the best things that probably happened was a riding school because you learnt to care about the horse there, whereas nowadays there's a lot of riders that are just at home with their family or their mother, and they don't really get that type of experience. Um, I mean, it just it just has changed over the years in that aspect of the care and welfare for a horse, and I think the more that... You know, it's great that we have more sponsorship in some ways and with world class, et cetera. But the more riders are pressurised in to get results for medals, you know, for prizes, as soon as you introduce money into anything, it puts that added pressure on, whereas sometimes their judgment fails where it might not have done. Thank you, Jackie. Um, and and I guess, um, Johan, I mean, is it achievable for national federations? Uh, well, I cannot answer for everyone, but but of course, uh, what we can do is educate. Uh, everyone in, uh, involved can can be a part of a course. Uh, we have riding schools in Sweden, and we 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 start with the young athletes, of course, all all the way. That's one thing that we could do. The other mm -hmm. thing that is is about culture. And saying it's it's okay, you can trust us. If you if you leave a picture, if you tell your story, we can guide you. We cannot do everything, but we can guide you, and 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 we can be trustable for people that wants to to whistleblow uh, to to sort of uh, so so that they can feel safe about that. That that is uh, important. And I, and I think that also that is why I say uh, told you about the communications. It's important to also stress uncomfortable questions as a federation. It's it's how you get trustworthy, I, I think. And and the third thing I, I, I put it in, in the chat, it's about information, a guidance where you can report uh, both to the federation and to the governmental structures and so on. And I, I understand that you cannot read it, but we use it very positively, uh, uh, I think, uh, where, where you, so, so that we can guide everyone involved. This is uh, where you can report. That's three things that we can achieve in taking care of horse well issues. Thank you, Johan. Um, finally, Constance, um, how do we balance the, the management of sports rules with criminal rules? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, in my view, criminal rules are pretty much the baseline. That's the behavior that we expect from every person that lives in our country. So it's the minimum behavior that we expect from everyone. And sports rules, they may be stricter and they can also be more detailed than the criminal rules. But it's kind of obvious that a criminal rule focuses on the effect that an action has on the animal. And we're going to have to work with that too. But we can also identify special methods that we don't want to be um, practiced in training or the preparation for a competition or something like that. So my answer to this is we may be stricter. We can't um, it can't be enough for us to say, well, there's a criminal rule. That's just the baseline, the very bare minimum. We have to be more detailed, but we are never going to achieve a set of rules that um, regulates all types of actions that people are going to come up with. So we're always going to need general clauses um, that, give the, that give us the flexibility to deal with those cases that we didn't anticipate. And there's one thing I want I would like to add because you were wondering whether there's federations that had reporting systems in place and informed um, people about it. Uh, our approach to this is that the more local, the more regional we we can address such incidents, the better. And that's why we encourage our clubs to install persons of trust. We call them Tierschutzvertrauensperson, just to give you this nice German word. And their job is not as much to um, 
well, sanction. Their job is to mediate and to bring people into contact and talk about these issues, which might be like they need to be knowledgeable about horse welfare. And that is going to help those people who don't dare to do it alone. And in really bad cases, they can report those incidents to us or to our members who work on a state level, and we can impose sanctions after it. So um, I think it's important, somebody said that earlier already, um, to have people in place that work on a local level and that can mediate cases and yeah, bring people into contact and inside conversation. Thank you for that. Um, I, I think another question that's, that's sort of been raised is, is can the national federations use their systems for human safeguarding for horse safeguarding? And I think Constance or, you know, or Johan, perhaps you could, you could answer this. Yes, of course we can. Uh, it, when it comes to regulations, uh, it's mainly the same rules, uh, both for the human being and the horse. And, and our sport is all about the human being and the, the horse together. So of course we come, uh, we can. Uh, so, so when we talk about a safeguarding person, it of course can at the same time be a, a horse wealth person or we're talking about the board of the local club. Uh, though both issues can be addressed in the same time. So when talking about education, uh, we do it uh, as a combination, of course. Uh, so so uh, that's uh, that's a possibility and and as in germany both safeguarding for the human being and the of the well-being of the horse is the, the strategic tool um, topic uh, topics of our strategy so so uh, for sure and we also see that in the cases where the horses are not treated well the human beings are not treated well so we, we see a combination of those Two, two issues on the other way around when the horses are happy and, and the, the, the people are happy so 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 that is that is what we can follow thank you i i agree with that it's just that uh, my feeling is that we're even like we're more experienced with animal welfare cases than we are with safeguarding uh, cases because those are newer so um yes like we can learn from the other area we can learn from safeguarding from reporting systems but i feel we are more experienced with horse welfare actually and the systems may even be more elevated than the other ones i think my experience as a journalist uh when there is a, a rider serious rider injury at a major event um the public perception is of, of very little interest over the rider, but of quite significant interest if a, if a horse is euthanized. So I, th I think it shows certainly in the UK that we definitely are a nation of, of animal lovers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, Ulf is, is raising his hand, but I was stressed out earlier. As, as you said, Eleanor, I was in the gymnastics uh, earlier. And, and the, the, I, I guess you talk about about human being, beings there, not horses, and 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 the gymnastic family has worked very hard with the safeguarding. So I I see a connection here, and I see a pro opportunity to work also with with other sports when it comes to these areas. But of course, we have an animal, so so it, we we have some differences. Uh, having that said, I think that we can de develop the the, the main, two main areas, and at the same time, thank you. Ulf, um, do you have anything to, to sort of contribute to this? Two things I want to highlight. Uh, one that uh, Johan uh, ended up with. Um, when, when we tried to do this in Sweden early on, uh, there's 70 sports federation in Sweden, whereas only three of them use an animal. So the main interest is not for the animals. So, so it's hard to get a, a rule, a legislation, a test in place, for all sports, which also contain the horses. So it's much easier and we have come much further in, in uh, sexual harassment and abuse. FEI have taken a huge step regarding harassment and abuse for athletes, but not for the horses in, in the same sense. Because for the athletes, it, it doesn't matter if it's during competition or otherwise. So, so I, I think 
we, we could use the same system, but it's a, a longer way to go. Um, the good thing right now that has this has been brought to the table, it's getting up out in the open. And then we're back to what uh, Rolle said. Then it's back to culture and peer pressure. So I think when, when this all started with the, uh, the high profile uh, uh, events that we have seen, that put pressure on all athletes. So, so from that point of view, it's good, even if we don't have regulation. So just that it's brought to the table, that we talk about it, that the Federation talk about it, that it's brought up an FAI, puts a pressure on the ones misconducting. So I, I think this is, we, we, we will for sure move in the right direction. And that is good. Thank you. Brilliant. I think it's, um, we should move on to our, our second main discussion point. And I think the, the secondary issue that the survey has highlighted comes from the wider perspective of why people feel, uh, or, or why we feel people are engaging in these poor practices. From the survey, respondents have raised the issues of modern day competition with the criteria of dressage judging, the standards of national officials and the role of the Young Horse Championships as some of the key issues that have been raised. So perhaps, um, perhaps if we start, um, uh, Johan, um, perhaps you could comment on this. Uh, I'm, I'm not surprised. Uh, dressage is, is um, as I told you earlier, dressage is the basic fundamentals when we start with young horses, not dressage as a, a form of competition. It's the basic, the fundamental of, of, of all riding, coming back to young athletes in gymnastic and young uh, horses in, in the question. I think that we Lil, we didn't. We don't need to change the world upside down here. We have a wonderful, wonderful sport, but just to slow down a little bit, slow down for 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 a moment, and 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 really think through what is what is the reasonable step to take. And one thing is is uh, training of the young horse and and judging and and judging how can how can relaxedness be more involved? How can the form of the horse be be be, be upgraded uh, uh, in, in a sustainable way? And 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 how how can we uh, sort of put uh, competition, uh, young uh, horses' experience in competition in, into into a, a more or less education and not not only going for stride for the for the points from from the beginning. That that is 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 a it's a range of of, of uh, issues to discuss. But as I said, uh, we think it would be very positive to to discuss dressage a little bit into uh, a deeper ground and uh, see what comes comes out of that. Thank you, uh, and Constance, perhaps you can sort of reiterate um, the changes that have been made in in Germany specifically in this discipline. Yes, there are two things that I um, would like to point out today. One is not quite as much a change as a change that we didn't make, and that's re regarding um, collective marks. So we've kept collective marks, and they are carry quite a lot of weight um, when it comes to the final score. And one of these um, collective marks, especially in higher classes, is actually harmony. And we feel that a harmonious test is what we need to be um, going for. So we don't want our sport to become more and more spectacular. We want it to be harmonious. So harmonious needs to be the new spectacular, which is why I think that these collective marks are so important. And I know that it's exactly the same things that need to be graded during uh, the lessons as well, but it's so much harder if you need to do it while grading other things. If you can do it at the end as a collective mark, it's so much easier for the judges. So we feel that this is quite important. And a change that we have, or a new thing that we have implemented a couple of years ago was a set of criteria that is designed for the warm-up area. And it's focusing on the behavior of the horse it operates with a traffic light system, thereby allowing a situation to be marked as yellow, which is neither good 
which would be green, nor a direct violation of horse welfare. And I think this, uh, we have made really good experience with um, this set of criteria. And to me, it's very logical that it works because as a lawyer, my experience is that it's very difficult to make black and white decisions. And this is especially true if you remember what I said earlier about proving uh, that a certain type of training has happened. It's very hard. And if you bear in mind that the people who need to make decisions at an event are mostly not legally trained, um, this becomes even more transparent. So this is why we try and offer them options. Of course, there are cases that are so bad that the only tenable reaction is a disqualification. But this isn't true for most of the situations, which is why we feel like this traffic light system that offers you a gray area or a yellow area where you need to talk to the people instead of disqualify them or take like um, a strong action, disqualify them, um, impose a sanction or something like that is the way forward. Thank you. Um, Roly, of course, you're privy to so many horse related sports. And I think it's fair to say that equestrian sport is the sort of competitive examination of the relationship between horse and rider. We, you know, we talk about harmony, but you know, most horses won't work for you if they don't feel that harmonious relationship. But if you were to compare, if you were to talk about equestrian disciplines in comparison with maybe polo or horse racing, um, do you think equestrian is heading more in the right direction in terms of the sort of the right practices? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I, I, as I said at the end of my uh, brief uh, presentation, I think there is a direction travel in all sports. I think there is a greater recognition uh, that not only do we need to um, con continue to develop how we're caring and training our horses in all disciplines, but we need to be able to tell, show the world that too. I suppose I'm I'm slightly slightly uneasy about the focus on dressage because I think, as you, you've rightly pointed out, it, this is all a question disciplines, and I, I know here we're talking mainly within the the FEI sports, but I, and, and there are issues uh, certainly with all the major FEI disciplines. We 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 we're familiar with the issues there, so I think it it's very dangerous, and I think there is often a tendency with some in the equestrian sector to sort of finger point and, and say, oh, it's, it's OK over here, but it's much worse over there. And that is completely counterproductive. Um, I think when you look at the motivations in terms of the questions, Ellie, that, that, that you originally posed here about, I think it is really understand, important to understand where people's motivations are. And some people will be motivated by a winner to all cost mentality, maybe very few, but there will be some. Uh, there will be some who will be, mo you know, not motivated, but sort of, you know, just the peer pressure of of, of the environment in their which they're working. And and Jackie touched on that. And then obviously, as I say, there's a significant amount of people who are just ignorant uh, to what their horse is telling us. So I think that role of education is, is is really important. I think the example of the young horse classes for me, there's a classic uh, opportunity there. We're doing an investment at the Royal Veterinary College, developing this ethical framework. Uh, to, to help uh, disciplines guide themselves on what is a, a justifiable, they pose a question and as a framework to go through to come out with a justifiable answer at the end. And I think um, the, the Young Horse Classes is a classic one where that, that could be put in uh, use for, for different disciplines. Um, and I think this whole area does link back to the first the first part of the discussion as well. But this collective responsibility of, you know, everyone um getting involved in in actually uh, trying to create this culture change create that peer pressure and i think for, for me a key action that, that's come out of the discussion so far is it it's not just a national federation it starts with the yards it starts with the clubs it starts with people individually and it grows from there and it's important to have the structures in place to support be, be able people to be able to take action when they do need to take action or be be informed and get educated where they need to, to be further educated. Thank you. Um, and Jackie, um, you've obviously worked in a number of disciplines, but but sort of mainly focused on eventing. What is the state of play in, in, in terms of, of, of poor practice and, and positive practice in eventing? Um, I'd like to think it's better in positive practice at the moment. 
But I think with the pressure that riders have of sponsors, you know, nowadays keeping a sponsor with the cost of living crisis, you've also got owners with, you know, they want to see their horse going well. And there's a wider pool of riders now. So that competition is higher than when I started, dare I say, 30 odd years ago. <laughs> you know, there's a lot more top riders. So there's a lot hotter comp competition. Um, I mean, I still say that, as we always say, education is key to it. And I think, you know, maybe this could be promoted a little bit more on the groom side through the national federations on best practice. Because I think, you know, ultimately to see your horses do well and be your friends is what we all want. But, you know, in the real, in the real world, it's not always what happens. Thank you for that. And I, I think the other, um, the other thing we see that, that is often quite confusing um, is, a, is um, a slight lack of innovation within the saddlery um, uh, sort of bitting equipment side of things. Um, and I think there's a lot of confusion over things. You know, there's rule changes amongst the FEI, which is show jumping, brush eventing. Um, uh, you know, on a on an almost monthly basis, I I, I would say. Um, do you think, Jackie, that we're sort of that riders are now beginning to get a better understanding of of what is a, an item of equipment that that may possibly have detrimental effects uh, on a horse? Um. I'd hope so, but sometimes, you know, I'm asked questions about a certain bit or piece of tack and people actually haven't got a clue about how it works a horse, how they perform with it. So I think there is, you know, like I say, there's so much on the market that you can buy that people have no clue how that will affect the horse. So I think, you know, manufacturers could maybe be encouraged to have a little bit more information with the things that they sell, you know, with, how this will put pressure on the pole, how it would put pressure in the mouth, etc. Whereas, you know, a bit sold or a training gauge sold, and often people don't even know how to use it to the best of its ability. Have you ever had to approach a, a rider or a groom at a competition and explain you're not using those side reins correctly or anything? Do you have any personal experience of seeing uh, equipment used incorrectly uh, that, that may well be a wel welfare issue? I mean, in the eventing, the FEI stewards are quite strict about that. You know, you can't use draw reins at the competition or any of those different aids. So I personally haven't come across that. I mean, I've maybe advised people because I'm, I'm dreadful. I can't keep my opinions to myself. <laughs> <laughs> as you know from the quarter sheet <laughs> um and i think that's the difficulty nowadays nobody is encouraged to help you know everybody's put in their little compartments and boxes and you must keep in those whereas i think some of us older grooms ought to take that initiative i think that was a very good proverb from the military if you're willing to go past it then you're willing to accept it and that's so true and i know i've often sometimes made myself unpopular by saying actually you ought to do this type of thing you know not necessarily with the training gaze but in the welfare and the well-being of the horse thank you jackie um actually it, it's it's also been pointed out um you know question that's come from outside how are the eef um, the national federations and the the fei working together to coordinate rules I guess this is a question for 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 Johan for Constan well, maybe Kelf yeah. as well. Um, <laughs> we are all in the same. We are in. The, we are all in the same family. We go. We go for the Jamboree Assembly together. We work in between. As I said, we we met. Uh, we met at events. We we tried to meet in the Nordic countries. We tried to meet here. Actually, our meeting from the Nordic country was the beginning of this meeting. So so it's it's the sports is also about meeting people. We do it now in this way uh, but we do also meet in person to person and 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 at at, at physical places also uh sharing best practice is also i think perhaps we we need to st stretch out sharing best practice and uh what we did in denmark and in sweden we started up a mouth program not from the top down level from but from the 
from from the basic program program so everyone invo involved in question sport had a film that was provided from the federation but the film and and a program uh how to shake your mouth on your horse for the daily basis and that that really was successful both i know in denmark and and, and also in sweden uh and and really uh, all, all all injuries uh, almost disappeared from when we checked that checked it later on in, in competition so so what we do is not only regulations we share also best practice when it comes to uh to um to uh, education and and the mouth program i must say is is important to stretch out, and and I know I I have the privilege to meet Rowley uh, a couple of times, and of course we 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 don't think that the solution is to point out stressage. I, I'm I'm I have said it so many times now. It's it's about the fundamentals in in all riding. So when we work with regulations, we we have general regulations for all disciplines, and the best regu regulations are of course. At, at the general le level, both when it comes to older horses, but also young horses. But meeting and, and uh, sharing experiences is uh, key uh, to success, I believe. Roly, do you feel that you've seen sort of collaboration amongst all the federations? Um, thank you, Ellie. Uh, you can tell Johan doesn't know me very well because he still calls it a privilege meeting me. Uh, you meet me a couple more times, Johan, you'll find there's no privilege. Um, but yeah, I think absolutely there is a lot more collaboration. I, I suppose the question, because the EEF, as I understand it, doesn't make any rules and regulations. It's a national federation and FEI level. But I think... Um, and I don't think there necessarily needs to be one rule book that goes across the world because um, it, it's not going to be possible. But even within Europe, you've got a lot of different uh, cultures and, and approaches. So it's not necessarily a one size fits all um, approach, but clearly having as much consistency as possible is, is really important. And as we've heard a, a lot today, having that sort of uh, framework in place and people understand it. So raising that awareness of what people can do if, if they have um, something that they want to share, something that they want to report. So I think it's having that framework in place and, and making sure it's clearly sign, signposted to people. So yeah, I don't, I don't think it, it, it's one size fits all. Um, I do think there is, this is an opportunity for me to say, you know, when we, we often talk about the precautionary principle um, and often people will only um, <laughs> um, to create rule changes when there's an cut and dry sort of recommendation from research. But as we've already heard from Constance, you know, life doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that with the law and it doesn't work like that with research. And I think when a body of uh, evidence comes and it, it's showing a significant um, sort of doubt on training practices or an, or an approach, then I honestly think we the right thing to do is to take the precautionary principle, which is then to stop doing that practice or approach until the evidence comes uh, available. But actually, it's not a problem. You can always put that back in later on, uh, but you're taking the benefit of the doubt on the horse's side uh, rather than how it often comes across where we're taking it on the status quo side. And I, and I honestly think that is wrong. Thank you, Rowley. So um, perhaps we should sort of move on to, to our sort of concluding question and, and sort of a summary of, of the thoughts today. Um, so, um, you know, there, there's clearly the need to create actionable outcomes now. You know, there, there've been a lot of talk about the issues. We have recommendations on all um, on all aspects of, of equine welfare from, from the, um, the EWC, the, um, um, the, the FEI Ethics and Wellbeing Committee. Um, so, so how do we really move this discussion on? You know, it is education truly the center for this, uh, you know, and how do we give everybody access to this information? Um, Roly, perhaps we can start with you here. Thank you. That's very kind. Um, so, yes, I, mean, I, I think there is, it's really important to have a framework uh, for, for reporting. Um, and I think that can be done at an informal and a formal level. Um, and I think um, without that, th there, there won't necessarily be the trust, both within but certainly outside the sector, that there is clearly a process that uh, people can follow and have the confidence 
to be able to do that. Uh, and I think um, w w that that is a fundamental piece of the jigsaw. But for sure, um, education and awareness to create that culture change, to create that peer pressure where people do the right thing is vital. So I think and the I think in terms of guidance there in terms of priorities, I think the Equine Ethics and Wellbeing Commission have provided some excellent um, uh, sort of six, six areas that, that they included, including around TAC, uh, but also issues around the other 23 hours. Um, and so because the focus is so often what we're doing when we're riding or training our horses, but actually they spend far longer not being ridden or trained, except possibly if you're in a sport of endurance. Um, and um, I think issues around um, what um, is the underpins good welfare, you know, our greater understanding now mental well-being is as important as physical welfare. So it's important around that five domains model of animal welfare that, you know, the overall mental state of the horse is maximised to give them a good life. Um, and to be able to do that, having a much better understanding, if there's one topic to take away in terms of education, it must be around learning theory and how horses learn and what positive and negative reinforcement really mean. And I think um, and, and, and how to put that into practice in our training practice. And I think if, if we could start to sort of really get far more, there was some research done recently, lots of people said they knew about positive reinforcement and equine learning theory. But they said yes, they knew about it, but when asked, it was very clear that they didn't uh, because they got most of the questions asked about it wrong. So I think there is a real challenge there around creating those education programs that's really going to make a difference to the lives of our horses to give them a good life, which is what obviously what we we're all seeking to do. Thank you. Um, I think um, perhaps we should go to the National Federations now. Constance, we haven't heard from you in a little while, but how do you think we, we can sort of move this, move on this? Where do we go from here? Well, I agree with Roly. I think education is at the centre of this, and um, that goes both for equestrians as well as judges, because earlier, you, um, Roly, you had this um, graph when you had that showed that sanctions are really just the tip of the iceberg so we need a lot of people who are really knowledgeable and not only about how you write a certain lesson but about the expressions of and the behavior of the horse that sign the signs that horses show when they are suffering and uh, as you just said um, learning theory so what what actually happens inside the horse we need people to know about this and we need our judges to be able to um well transport the the rules that we have that i think are really quite good already into real life so i think that's the um aspect that we need to focus on education it has the beauty that we have we have got it in our hands. We, it's actually something that we can do. And the more people that really know about it, the better it's going to get. I'm always surprised how few people can really explain why a certain me method has a certain effect, what happens to the horse, what signs a horse shows. So we need to um, yeah, educate people so there's more of us who can actually explain it also to outsiders, so they can understand what we're actually doing. Okay, Johan, um, your own thoughts on this? What next? What happened? Yes, the, the president started this meeting by talking at home. I think that we have rules. We have excellent rules. We need to follow them. Things happen in competitions, yes. Things happen at the riding school, yes, but not we had not many cases. We are a strong sport. We are well organized. We need a change in culture. And we need to understand that we are, on one hand, a very positive sport, but we also have very huge business. So we need to, to stress out the question, why? Why do people end up in situation treating their horses that they shouldn't treat in a bad way. They know that they, they shouldn't treat them more than bad, but they do it. Uh, they do it anyhow. Is it is it is it is it of, of of money or is it lack of time or what is it? So I think the next next step is actually 
more of a change in culture, I, I would say, and, and, and that we sort of be brave and, and talk about this also a little bit uncomfortable questions, but then it will turn the other way down and, and people will, not, will understand how wonderful it is with a meeting between human and horse and how wonderful it is that we can have a sport at the same time that we have a growing private business so that uh, that the that the two elements will 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 sort of grow in 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 combination also in the future thank you that that is my thoughts thank you sorry Roly, just to put you in the firing line again um purely because i i uh, you organized a, a fascinating media event last year mm. on the social license and and um and one of the discussions was the possibility of of um of having of horse ownership licenses. Um, and I'd be interested to know, um, you know, whether that went anywhere uh, uh, and also really from the other federations, whether that's something you've considered, you know, should people have a license to own a horse? Well, it's a very interesting question. Obviously there's no license to own a, have a child and yet people are sort of pushing to have licenses for, for uh, uh, ownership of animals. and. There is, you can absolutely see the, the merit of it. And, you know, there are countries like France and, and certainly Switzerland that could speak much better because they have systems in place. The, 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 the challenge for any licensing system is that it needs to be effective. Uh, part of that means that you have to have enforcement uh, and a lot of licensing systems just don't work because they're not enforced. Um, but you also need to create a system which is far more than just a tick box exercise. It actually means something and actually it's going to have tangible improvements, obviously, in this case, to, to, to the life of the horse. So I think um, licensing systems can have a place. I think it, d d different countries have a very different structure of how their equine sector is made up. Some are far more sort of integrated and together, some far more, far more um, sort of disparate. And I think, you know, for those disparate countries, and I, I'll probably put the UK as, as someone as a country more on the sort of the, 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 the sort of um, the wide uh, sort of net of, of, of the sector. It makes it far more difficult to put that licensing system in place so yeah, yeah I, I i as i say a place but just one piece of the jigsaw and by no means something that's going to have um without other aspects that we've talked about today it w won't won't move the dial that quickly and jackie i, I suppose it's a sort of similar question to you you know somebody who's managed a yard do you think it's sort of pragmatic you know do you think it's practical for, for a, a large sort of commercial yard or you know an event yard such as William Fox Pit to have these sorts of licenses in in, in place uh, and a code of conduct? Um, I think it's a good idea actually because we are talking about having a groom's charter with the FBI and IGA you know and I think it's the way forwards and to be honest most of the time if a groom's not looking after a horse they're on social media so <laughs> You know, I just wonder whether something can be more promoted on this. There's probably few grooms that would click onto a link, you know, for education, etc. But if we had more of an advertisement system coming up, you know, are you concerned about practices at home? You know, maybe the BEF could take something on board of this. You know, here, click on this link to learn about how your horse should be happy at home, how your horse should be going. I think a lot more could be done on that area. Thank you. Um, so, Ulf, um, I think um, perhaps you could tell us the, the role that the EEF can play in communication and education of this topic. Absolutely. I mean, uh, the, first of all, we are a association that links all this federation in Europe all together. So, so what we're trying to do is, of course, to see how we can get the best practices what we can share from one country to another country, in, in which way we can promote what's good and where, where we can um, do better. Um, so, so that's one side, uh, side of the coin. The other side is, of course, that we have uh, two seats in the FI board. So we have influence on the board as such. And to be able to do a good work there, then, of course, we need the inputs from the Federation. So we do the right things. So given the question that I had earlier on regarding the, the rules and so on, we work, of course, very intensive with the uh, 
uh, with the rules. Uh, we need the input from the Federation. We do make our voice heard at the mm -hmm. board meetings, etc. And as I said earlier on, I think uh, the FEI have come much, much further than many of the federations with the um, the athletes in regards to abuse and harassment than they've done with the horses. So I think there's more to be done in relation to the horses. Um, so so we, we could for sure do more from a pure communication point of view. And this is one example of what we do right now. And as I said earlier on, just to bring the topic to the table and start discussing it, then we can also make a change. If we continue not talking about it, then nothing will happen. So, so th this is one way that we try to achieve that. And actually, um, a question for, for both for Johan and Constanz, um, your own respective federations, is much money being put towards getting sort of scientific evidence that something is wrong. I mean, by way of example, tight nose bands, you know, it, it's, um, you know, it, you need to have that sort of the, the science behind it in order to bring a rule um, to the table. But, but is there sort of funding coming from national federations into that sort of thing? Well, there is funding but I cannot tell you if it's a lot or how much it is. Um, we are investing quite a lot of money in the whole mm. uh, horse welfare issue. For instance, when it comes to um, controls, medication controls and um, testing of horses, but there's also going some money into um, science. To be really honest with you, um, science is always a bit of a touchy subject because the outcome might not be what we like. So I'm um, with Roly when he says that we need to give uh, methods the benefit of the doubt from the horse's perspective. But um, well, science, sometimes we've been afraid to um, put methods to the test, to a scientific test, because we weren't quite sure what the outcome would be. So we are kind of careful with this. But yes, I agree with you. Um, science is the way forward. And we need to know about the effects of a method in order to really protect the horses. Yes, I would, you. Yeah, 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 we, I would say it's uh, quite large investments, but not only as a federation, we collaborate with the with, uh, university for agriculture, for, for example, uh, where, where they do a lot of studies. So, and we have investment from, from the private business when it comes to research in, in, into horses outside our federation, but, but we are a member of that organization. So, so that, that what we say, uh, we do invest, yes. When it comes to uh, cases uh, to, to investigate and, and sort of bring into uh, legislation. Uh, we do it uh, also there, but I must say that we work there very much with, uh, with volunteers, also with, with lawyers that are vo volunteers that, that help us. And, and that's also positive because there are a lot of people that wants to be a part of the equestrian family and, and uh, us as a federation. And I think that's also a way to work. You, you can invest, yes, but you can also ask people, do you want to join? Do you want to join this group and, and help us to provide um, uh, investigation for the future and so on. But research, yes, but mainly outside the federation with universities and so on. Thank you. Uh, and Roly, I suppose, you know, you, you've probably seen this uh, across all sports and all countries. That a lot of money is going on to, into British racing at the moment. There was a, um, the racing welfare group was set up. They're investing millions into sort of improving the welfare and horse racing. Um, do you sort of see similar things happening in the equestrian space? Yes, but I think, I don't think um, there's... I, I don't think it, there's enough investment at the moment. Um, as we've already talked, Constance has already mentioned, you know, there's not, it, it's not that cut and dry always. And sometimes, you know, you've got to ask, you know, the old saying, don't ask a question if you don't want to know the answer. But I think it's incumbent on us 
that we do have to ask those questions because we have the horse as part of this and that ethical responsibility to do that. So I think there needs to be a lot more collaboration around research. We know it's not simple necessarily uh, because, you know, if it was simple, it would be easy to done, do and it would be done a long ago. But I do think, again, the FEI's Commission, Equine Ethics and Wellbeing Commission has set, has set up a really good platform here, you know, to establish what is a good life for a sports horse and to be able to collaborate globally on, on that focus. And I think it's not going to be one institution, one federation or, or one individual. It's going to be a really collegiate effort to do that. Uh, and I think uh, that the, the FEI's Commission has been a really good starting point on that. Brilliant. Okay, well, there have been lots of good ideas shared today. Um, I, I think finally, Ulf, you know, perhaps, um, do you think that this can be collected together into a sort of guidelines or sort of code of, uh, of best practice going forwards? Um, first of all, um, uh, may, may, I, may I continue the route early on before I answer your question? Um, I think science is extremely important for us to have something to build our statements upon. So we just don't feel or think or uh, have a good idea. So, so I think it's of essence that we have the science to base our statement upon. And I think as writer Rolle said that we need to do this globally. So we need to learn from wherever there are learnings from that point of view. So are there, are there enough investment in each and every country and their federation? Absolutely not. Do we think that we globally can reach uh, a decent learning point? Absolutely. So, so I think I, I think we need to go there. Um, also, what Rod said earlier on, this is not only about resource; it's about all disciplines. So, so I think we need to emphasize that as well. We, the, what, what we saw from this uh, high, high kind of level ones uh, were mainly in the resource area, but we have seen in other areas as well. So, so I think that that's good to have in mind. Um, the breeding is extremely developing right now. We get more and more capable horses. So we can't be fooled by increasing the pressure earlier on in the horses. So therefore, I think what, what uh, I think Constance, you, you brought it up. So, so not fooling the judges to ask for things in early year classes that they shouldn't because the new horses are capable of doing it. So, so that, that's absolutely thing, the wrong thing to do. Or jump high, do the harder courses or whatever it is. So, so let's not fool ourselves just because we have an extremely good result of the breeding. Um, if we don't have the rules and regulation in place, which we apparently don't fully are at the such a stage, then I think culture and peer pressure could work very well. So just throwing the bad examples, just bringing them to the table, just talking about it, I think that's good. That's a good step. Because we don't have the rule regulation or license system that allows us to do very much more. Um, uh, said that, we will do our utmost best to assemble good ideas, share whatever we can do so we can learn from each other. Um, but uh, I, I don't see that we will have a total, this is the best practices, but, but I think we will co collect good ideas and share those. So th that I think we can do. Thank you. I, I think it's interesting what you say that we, we can learn from other areas. I, I think it's it's my own experiences. You can learn from other sports. Um, I developed a, a, the very first non-metal stud after watching women's football and being told that <clears throat> actually <clears throat> at most levels of football, they ban metal studs on account of the risk of injury. So set about developing a, a polymer stud. But it was there that I realized just quite how far the equine world lags behind human sport in, in so many things. Um, I, think, I think let's just sort of round up here and, and have a final comment um, perhaps from, from everybody who, who feels that they want to, to um, sort of contribute something. Um, Roly? Um, thanks, Ellie. Um, I, I, first, I just applaud the EEF for having, for having this webinar. And I think it, it, clearly this is a start of a conversation, not the end of a one. And I, so I think, you know, doing this again going forward would 
uh, I think is really important um, because as as Ulf and Johan and others have said, you know, that sharing uh, of of best practice, of good practice is a really important thing. I think two, two other points. Collective responsibility is something I've said r quite often, and I think it really is important on individuals and clubs and uh, yards all the way up to national federations that to have to create this culture that's based on good practice and empowering people to be able to have the confidence and, and know how to be able to call out bad practice. And I think it is incumbent on uh, the, the, the organisations, the federations and the FEI to create this framework where that reporting that kind of uh, those kind of issues is possible and there's a clear structure for doing that. So I think, you know, act, as ever, out of all of these discussions, it is the actions that come out of today that will be really important. Thank you, Roly. Um, Constance, anything final you'd like to add to this? Well, as I said earlier, I'm very grateful that I'm able to uh, take part in this con um, conversation. And we've heard so many great ideas today. And I think like the combination of all of them is going to bring us forward. Um, we've just talked about um, the discuss, like the discussion, aware raising awareness through this discussion is going to help a lot. And I think, well, that's the one good thing. We already have awareness uh, with regard to horse welfare, and that has helped during the um, recent years. We are talking about these incidents. People are covering it in the media, in social media as well, because there is awareness. And this is something that we need to use in order to improve the system. So I think discussing it, um, calling people out, that's going to be the way forward, especially if we can manage to make everyone more knowledgeable about what's right, what's wrong, how a horse is supposed to behave. Thank you. Um, Jackie, anything you would would like to say? Um, yeah, I think it's hugely important that we promote good practice at home because ultimately if a groom's not happy, they can leave anyway. And we are struggling to find good, conscientious staff in the industry nowadays. So the more we can promote this idea, the better, really. Thank you. <clears throat> Johan? Well, um, I think Jackie has been very brave. Uh, she's brave being in this meeting. Uh, tell your colleagues, all the grooms all over the globe, all people that works every day for the well-being of the horse, they are the uh, true heroes uh, in 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 their daily daily work. And and if some if they see some mistreatment, let us know. Uh, I'm I'm for the time being in a position where I can perhaps do some change, but it relates to all of you. So, so my reflection reflections go back to, to Jackie and, and her colleagues. Thank you. And finally, Ulf, was there anything you would like to add to this discussion? I mean, first of all, I want to thank everyone for contributing. If 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 it not if it didn't have the contribution, then we wouldn't be able to have this kind of discussion. So I think it's extremely good. Uh, I would like to thank you all who have spread the link for the, the uh, survey. So we got so many responses. Our whole idea of this webinar were to have the survey done, evaluated in well time before the sports forum, which is in two weeks time. So this has very well served the purpose. So we have gotten a survey, we got the responses, we have this meaningful discussion. Um, so I, I really think that you have contributed to the discussion that we will have at the sports forum in two weeks' time. 